good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or whenever you may be tuning in to the Growing Our Future podcast. You know, we just enjoyed bringing this podcast to all of our listeners because the future is just that. We got to grow it. And you can't grow it without planting the right seeds. And to help plant those seeds, we bring on these incredible guests, subject matter experts who are willing to share their time, their talent, their testimony, their expertise, their insights. And today is no different. Today we have uh, Neely Nelson. Neely is the public and government affair, head of public and government affairs, strategy and citizenship for Exxon Mobil. Neely, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Aaron. It's great to be here. And Neely is no stranger to the FFA. We're going to talk about that. She grew up in an ag education household. Mm-hmm. Uh, she grew up in livestock production. We're going to talk about that a little bit. We're going to talk about the pathway to where she's at today. Uh, Neely, I like to start every podcast with one question. And that question is this, what are you grateful for today? You have to start with the hard ones, right, Aaron? Um, You know, I've been very, very fortunate. I would say, especially after COVID, you really appreciate the health and and safety that you and your family have. And um, so that's what I would say today. Family, health, and safety. Couldn't agree with you more. I, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, if you get to watching the news or you're shuffling through much to social media, a lot of times it's really easy to kind of get a little negative, to get a little toxic. It is, but- especially during COVID. I think, you know, it was so different for all of us. And, you know, I actually rethought some of the people that I engaged with because some mm-hmm. folks could really um, get really brought down into a, a negative kind of focus uh, or le- and viewing everything through a very negative lens. And it was a certainly a very tough time, but I think you have to look for the positive and um, find the the opportunities and discomfort. And so I think, you know, we all reconnected with what was important to us and things that we took for granted, like our health um, and family time are things that I think we reevaluate now and put a different level of emphasis and focus on, or at least I know I did. Oh, I don't think there's any question. I think everything you just said, uh, you know, I tell people, I guess in, in my lifetime and probably yours, I cannot think of a single thing that impacted everybody that I ever knew. Everybody, everybody was impacted by COVID in one way or the other. But I will say this about that. In the world of agriculture, we're kind of used to it. Whether it's a flood, a geopolitical, a market disruption, tornadoes, fires, you just learn to, it's like you said, you you got a choice. And the choice is, how are we going to address it? And to your point, a lot of people have addressed it in a very positive way. Some dealt with it a different way. And we had to choose, you know, through our filter, what do we want to hear and what do we want to engage with? Right. A lot of truth to that. Well, thank you for sharing that. I agree with you. Uh, Love my family, love my country, love my freedoms, love my liberties. Uh, Love the fact that at the end of the month, I got a little bit of money left over. So, you know, maybe if I needed to help somebody else out, I could. You know, I think there's a lot more to be grateful for than to be disappointed about. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. Now you carry this incredible title and obviously I've had a front row seat in your career. So it's real easy for me to say, well, I expected it. But for those people that didn't know how Neely got into this job, into this position, into this role, can you kind of walk us through what your career path looked like? And it did. It started in the ag education home and it started in the FFA. But you're definitely somebody that we're proud to see succeed. And uh, I want you to take us on that journey of how you got to where you're at. Okay, great. Yeah, as you mentioned, Aaron grew up um, in a, at the time, it was a rural area. It's it's not so rural anymore. Um, my dad was an ag science teacher, so we grew up with cattle and livestock. I started in 4-H when I was um, mm-hmm. eight or nine, and, and so we started showing livestock, started doing some of their leadership programs, and it was something that we would do as a family. And then, you know, I'd always go along with dad as he would take his FFA teams to contest and you know, I'd be on the outside looking in, um, anxious to be able to to speak the creed or do parliamentary procedure because after school, when he would have practices, I would sit in the back of the room and, and listen. And so it was something 
that I looked forward to. Obviously, when I got into high school, um, I joined the FFA. They didn't have junior FFA at the time. So I joined FFA and, um, you know, was involved in as many things as, as I could from the leadership to the livestock activities. Uh, you know, we knew a lot of ag teachers and a lot of my friends obviously came from um, kind of FFA ag backgrounds. Um, I went to Texas Tech San m on an agriculture scholarship, um, majored in ag development and with an emphasis in journalism, I was on the FFA, the um, livestock judging team. So it did continue a lot of those things that I had done. I was a state FFA officer. So that first year, um, I also did, um, you know, my dual FFA uh, duties as, as state vice, vice president. Um, so, you know, it, it continued to stay with me. And, and it was all of those leadership activities and the friends and networks. So when I got into AM, I was involved in a lot of different kind of ag related activities or leadership programs, you know, continuing that I graduated um, had the opportunity to be a part of the inaugural class of the Georgia Bush School that's okay. located there at Texas A&M. Um, it was the the first class tied to his presidential library. Um, so I had a chance to be a part of that. It was extremely fascinating because he would come back. He would bring former Secretary of State Baker, other speakers in um, his son at the time. George W. was the governor of Texas. So he actually came and, and visited. So the interaction um, you know, was really fascinating and built on all of those leadership activities that I had grown up doing. Um, and then my um, emphasis area was environmental policy. So closely tied still to, uh, to agriculture. Um, I had done a couple of internships over the years. So at the time, I was a legislative assistant for agriculture during a summer for Congressman Stenholm. Um, at the time, I also did um, an internship in the um, Texas Natural Resources Conservation Commission that was the name at the time, but in, in that regulatory agency in the commissioner's office. So I had a chance to look at how we um, regulate water rights and, and other aspects of that that also cross in, you know, from oil and gas to, to agriculture. And then when I graduated, I had the chance to join ExxonMobil in Baytown, which at the time was their largest manufacturing facility, um, joined and um, never looked back. I've had an um, extremely fascinating career. I love um the variety that it offers, the the leadership foundation that I was given FFA, I, I, I pull on that every day. Um, and while it's with oil and gas, there is such a close connection with um, in coexistence, particularly in, in Texas and New Mexico and, and many of the rural areas, we've got oil and gas development. And so coexisting together and is something that I think is is important. And, you know, it's one of the reasons that we've been a proud supporter of the Texas FFA Science Fair. Um, there's a nice tie there. The focus on science STEM education is extremely important. And um, so many folks miss that opportunity to, you know, depending on where they are and the um, opportunities they have through their school programs. And so that's something that we're proud to be a part of. So, you know, when you look back, you think, did I think I was going to get here? you know, you, you never have a roadmap or a vision, but it, it all seems very logical to me. And, and it was really built on that strong foundation. You know, if I wouldn't have had that foundation that gave, provided the scholarships that allowed the opportunity to be a part of the Bush, each one of those was additive and kind of brought me to where I am today. And, and, you know, it's, something I've enjoyed. My brother also was a state FFA officer. So, you know, he followed his own path coming up through FFA as well. But I think we will all um, heartily agree that that leadership foundation mm -hmm. and that ability to network and engage with with others across the state is is invaluable. Okay, we can stop there. That was good. No, I'm just kidding. That, uh, But, you know, Neely, that right there is exactly why I enjoy doing these is because if people will just tune in and listen, it's not that I've got to ask you a specific question. It's just if you'll listen to somebody's story, if you'll listen to their testimony, there's an, these incredible nuggets of gold. And just in your story, I picked up on several things. And it started very young for you, by the way. So congratulations. Number one, you were paying attention. You said as, a, you said as an eighth and ninth grader, you were looking at 4-H and you was paying attention to what my dad was doing. I was watching the teams that were competing. I heard what you said. There's a, yeah. there's a lot of wisdom there. And, you know, it's like I tell my kids. I said, you know, listen, life is like a calf scramble. And they're like, what do you mean? I said, there's a lot of people that don't even sign up. They don't, 
they don't even put their name on the list. And I said, you got to be willing to pay attention that there's a list and you got to put your name on there. And then when you get your name on there, you're going to have to show up. And when you show up, you're going to have to hustle. Right. But if you catch it, that's when the real work starts. And Absolutely. that's your career. That's what you've done. You were paying attention. You said, I want to try that. Uh, I got to build my professional network. I love when you talked about building your professional network, both in high school and in college. And then as you interned, you expanded that even more. And then when you got to ExxonMobil, I love the fact that you said, what's next? There's got to be another opportunity here. So it sounds like your whole life has been built on some very simple philosophies that when duplicated, they continue to work. Is that fair? That's right. Absolutely. And I think, you know, to your point, I've been extremely blessed. And you look back over your life and you think of all the opportunities you were giving. And 100%, you know, God had a vision in that. My parents gave me a solid foundation. It was very fortunate. But you also have to make things happen because, to your point, you have to show up. Um, you know, you, you don't just compete um, and excel in a certain thing just because you sign your name on, on a list to be part of it. You have to be willing to, to work and to practice and to improve and to get back up when you fail. Um, you know, prioritize. Uh, you know, today, I, you know, we have a uh, my daughter's 13 and, you know, the technology influences that they have is so different um, from, from what they have. And it's easy to let life pass you by as you're sitting on a device and, you know, keep reminding her and, and, and she's very engaged. And, but it's, that's, I think so many of us sit there and then, you know, we look up, we've lost a whole year. We've lost an opportunity that we missed because we were engaging in something that was fun at the time, but really didn't allow um, us to make an impact or for others to make an impact on us. And so I think sometimes we have to just kind of step back and think about what we really want from life and, what you only get out of it, what you put into it. And, you know, I think I'm a firm believer that you've got to to show up, as you said, and, and want to be a part. And, you know, that was the thing I was, because I, I could sit there and watch these students, you know, I could see their achievements. Um, you know, dad was an ag teacher, we had a couple of other ag teachers, Mr. Voss, you know, long time, and, and they're hard workers, they would work with the students, they'd be willing to do night practices after school before practices, you know, all of those things, but the kids have to show up, up for that too. And, and so, you know, there are so many champions out there, but everybody has to play a role together. And so I think that's one of the, you know, the piece, key piece of advice is, you know, don't do what's maybe fun or engaging at the time. I mean, FFA is absolutely fun, but you also have to do, put in the work. And so I think it's sometimes just stepping back and what do you really want out of life and what do you really want as your opportunities? And those opportunities then open doors down the road. And so you can't just look up and go, I wanted this great job, but I wasn't willing to mm -hmm. do the things along the way that allowed me to get there. And, um, you know, if you want to go to college and find ways to engage, to get scholarships, if you want to find opportunities, look for internships. If you want to, um, you know, set up certain jobs, then you work on certain degree paths. You know, all of that is is a plan, and it makes sense. But I think so many times, again, life will pass you by, and you look up and you go, oh, "I wish I would have focused on that two years ago," because now I'm out of time. Yeah, there's no no doubt that if you're not careful, you, you'll miss an opportunity. That that's why I said you got to be paying attention. When's, when's the sign up? <laughs> you know, right. you got to be paying attention. And uh, again, you've said a lot of things here that I want to I want to kind of flesh out because it's just really good stuff listening to you talk. Number one, there are over 3000 high schools in the state of Texas. Every one of them's got to graduate in class. That means that they're going to all graduate. They're all going to be out looking for a job, a scholarship or an opportunity. So for the young people that are listening, my question to you is, what is your competitive edge? What separates you from your peers? Because somebody's like Neely's paying attention and they're looking for the talent pool. They're looking who's going to fill these roles in this company, who's going to fill the roles in this organization. So what skill set are you developing that gives you a competitive edge and can give you a leg up against the competition? And I think if you listen to what Neely said, she she was always paying attention to how do I improve myself? What can I learn from my peers? Uh, you know, when I see them excel, how can I duplicate that? When I see them stumble, how can I avoid that? But I heard those things loud and clear as you as you told your story. 
Neely, one of the things that that I wanted to share, because I think as a, Neely is also a member of the Texas FFA Foundation Board of Directors. And Neely, one of the things that y'all supported is our lead program and our legislative lead program. And I think one of the things I found this very interesting, I don't know if you remember this or if I shared it with y'all, but when we did the very first legislative lead program and the legislative lead is where we bring students and teachers to the Texas Capitol and we put them through a two day seminar on how to become a trusted advisor to their elected officials, somebody that people lean on, lean into, want to know their opinion about things, but it's because they trust them. But in that, Neely, I was surprised. One of the kids and their critiques, their one of their number one takeaways, I could not believe this, was they said, we did not realize there was a career there. We did not know that we could go into advocacy, into a trade association, into a company's public relations and governmental affairs. They did not know that that existed. Now, I don't know where we lost that along the way, because like you, I knew that existed back in my day in ag science and FFA, but I think you're right. I think we've got these distractions today that sometimes we're not always paying attention to those opportunities to sign up, but at least by the foundation board and y'all supporting that project, at least we were able to bring that to the kids. But in your role, what what does a government affairs, public and government uh, government affairs, and you know strategy and citizenship job look like? What what do you do? Well, and there's a lot of variety to the job, and I think that's one of the reasons I love it is that no two days are alike. Um, at the end of the day, everything that we're doing is trying to advance the the reputation um, of the company and and enable our ability to to operate. Um, so it has a lot of components. You know, I, I look back and and you talked about you know competitive advantage. You know, I would say, you know willingness, I think, is the key thing. I think there's so many times, you know, we'll even have candidates that we interview. And, you know, I hear this from folks that work at other places. And, you know, I think so many times people say, well, I only want to do this, um, or I only, this is what my vision of something is. And I think sometimes, to your point, we don't know what's out there till we actually see it. So I think that openness and that willingness to try something, um, to get your, your, you know, feet on the ground, to get a grounding, being exposed to different things because over time that's how you determine what you're better at than other things what you have a passion for versus other things you know my internships were all fantastic but the thing that they helped me do the most was they eliminated career opportunities for me because I knew after doing an internship that wouldn't be necessarily the right fit for me it's a great learning wouldn't have replaced it but that helped me then focus a different direction and you know we always say when folks are coming in, they should be interviewing us as much as we're interviewing them. Finding that fit is is going to be important, but sometimes you don't know what that fit is until you've had, um, mm -hmm. you know, a chance to try some different things. And so, you know, every day is different. A lot of what I do is, is focused on leadership. So it's um, working with our teams, helping our leaders, uh, you know, develop their goals and, and a strategy so that their teams know what they're working toward, you know, advancing the business objectives. But a lot of that really is leadership focused. And so, you know, I think I go back, again, it's one of those things that you you take for granted because everybody has that leadership experience when you're coming up through FFA. Mm -hmm. And and then you you have you go out to campuses for recruiting or you go um, and you interview candidates or just folks that you you come in contact with. And, you know, and I know that it's the lost art of writing a thank you note, but the thank you notes that I get from the ambassadors every year at the FFA convention are far better than most thank you notes I will get from a senior graduating somewhere. Um, because people just don't focus on, you know, writing and, and that engagement, that personal touch. And that's something that we we get in FFA that's just automatic. And that poise and that confidence, that ability to communicate, you know, we'll judge, I'll judge the science fair and kids that are sophomores, juniors, and you'll go, wow, they're more impressive than these folks that I just met on the college campus that are graduating because it's a level of focus and engagement that they put in, they put in the work. And, um, you know, we're very fortunate to have ag science teachers who want to make a difference, you know, in many of our communities, um, we have 
you know, there's certainly a, a lot of additional demands on teachers and a shortage of, of teachers as we go through. And so having those teachers that want to put in the time and help you, um, you know, that's something to take advantage of so that you actually can build on a solid foundation. And so, you know, I'm rambling a little bit, but those are some things that, you know, when you think back, all of those things are things that I pull and let as levers in what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And you don't realize how fortunate we are until you engage with others and you realize what we have in FFA is extremely special. You know it's special when you're in it, but when you step out, that's when you really appreciate the difference maker. By the way, oh gosh, Neely, you just said a bunch right there. So one of the things that you talked about is exactly what this podcast is about. If you want to know what the future is, grow it. All those skills that we planted, say in the creed, all of those skills we planted doing parliamentary procedure, that, you know, public speaking, problem solving, you know, what do I do? Where's the bailing wire? Where's the duct tape? <laughs> you know, all of those things lend themselves later in life to folks like you who are looking for folks to fill jobs. Right. And the fact that you notice it, you said it. You said, I noticed those things. I I don't know. I think that's pretty impressive. Uh, you guys supported the, the Foundation Board of Directors. You know, another project that I took to the board years ago was a research project. And I just had this idea that kids that enter high school ag science and are involved in FFA will finish high school at a higher rate, go to college at a higher rate, have access to more scholarships than their peers, finish college at a higher rate, are less troublesome in high school than their peers. Anyway, we just had an idea and we researched it. And guess what? We found out we were right. Well, Neely, we just redid that research and I'll be bringing it to the board. But uh, once again, it validated everything that you just shared that uh, we know that our kids, our FFA kids are outperforming their peers. Uh, and I believe it's all of these little things that we've planted in their life that not only do they cultivate some of those while they're in high school, some of them cultivate them in college. But to your point, a lot of times you don't even realize how valuable it is until you start your career path. I often laugh, but, you know, parliamentary procedure was something that was very important to my dad. And so, again, I had watched um, the teams compete and and so knew that backwards and forwards before went in as the freshman year and when we had a team and, and actually went on to nationals um, and parliamentary procedure but that was so important and you don't realize how important it is till the first time you attend a community meeting right. and they can't figure out how to advance a motion and everybody's um, moving things but nobody knows how to second something or to amend it or to make a change and you know it's one of those things you kind of cringe because you want to help them out, but you know you don't recognize those basic skills that really are part of kind of moving society forward until you're actually engaged in that and you realize, wow, um, what we were learning as freshmen in high school are something that you know adults who've been in these community organizations for 15 years have not been able to figure out. And again, it's something that is a an opportunity that that we're given in addition to what we learn in the classroom. So Neely, you know my story. I'm a, I'm a kid from Dallas. I got placed at Boys Ranch. I'm a green hand. I'm a freshman at Boys Ranch, and they put me on the parliamentary procedure team. I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, my gosh, what did, what do you mean I get to learn how to argue? You know, you you go through that. Well, fast forward years later, 1988, I'm the district director for a member of the United States Congress. I'm 23 years old. I don't know what he was thinking. I didn't know who FICA was. I didn't know what escrow was. And here I am, the gatekeeper to a member of Congress in 37 counties. But I thought, you know, I've still got to improve myself. So I, I joined the largest civic club in my community. I joined the downtown Rotary Club. I used my professional networking skills to build networks. But then they told me about this program called Leadership Wichita Falls. And they said, you got to go through these leadership programs to learn about your community. I said, sign me up. So in that process, we went through a program called board development, how to become an effective board member. And I, here I am, 23 years old, not from this community, but I'm in the room with all the community somebodies, the legislators and the business owners and all, and we're going to do board training. 
Neely, exactly to your point, I watch these people fumble around and I'm sitting there trying to bite my tongue going, I learned more about how to run a meeting as a freshman, <laughs> Texas panhandle, than what y'all represent as community leaders. Yeah. Well, and when you think about it, where would they have gotten that I know. training, right? I you know, know, when you think about it and we have it at our fingertips, it's all, you know, it's kind of that whole this saying, the world is your oyster. When you're in FFA, the opportunities are there. It's finding out what you want to take advantage of and you've got four years to do it. So that that's what was fantastic is you could do something that first year compete out of it or continue to compete in it, but you, you try that, you try something else. And to your point, farm skills, uh, you know, chapter, I even learned how to, you know, change oil on a tractor. I couldn't probably remember exactly how to do it now, but at the time that farm skill was great. Um, you know, when, when dad was doing something out in the pasture. So, you know, it, it's really interesting. And in, in the public speaking alone, the extent speaking, the ability to think on your feet, um, to pull from questions, you know, again, that all adds to that poise and presence that you present um, when you're engaging with others and people will make a snap, you know, impression of you. And, you know, I love the quote is, you know, um, I cannot hear what you say because your actions speak so loudly. And, you know, I think we only get that minute to make a first impression, to make that contact, you know, as you're going in for that job interview and there's, you know, hundred other candidates competing against you, what makes you stand out? What makes you different? And, you know, and that's your leadership story, right? And in FFA, you learn to tell your leadership story. And, you know, it, it's something that you don't think about until you realize that other people really never had that opportunity or a champion to help them find their own way. Okay. I'm, not, I'm writing this down. That might be the name of this podcast, by the way, is tell your leadership story. <laughs> So, you know, that right there, uh, people that know me know that there's, uh, I'm always saying, live your brand. Live your brand. Uh, one of our board members, uh, one of your colleagues is Cleo Franklin. Mm -hmm. And Cleo was telling me about his grandfather. And his grandfather told him, he said, Cleo, he said, never speak on the obvious. And he said, don't ever forget game recognizes game. Now, the reason I say that is because you're in a leadership role at Exxon Mobil, but you've very, very clearly articulated that when you're out scouting and you're looking around, you can recognize a game. You know, and authenticity is so important to me. And um, and again, I think it came from kind of that FFA foundation is that you would see folks that you know, um, we're presenting a certain way. Are they that way when they're engaging with you individually? You know, that authenticity is part of your, your personal brand to your point. Um, and so I continue. And I think that's one of the things that we forget that leadership is a journey. So I'm still growing and learning. We had, had a meeting and I, you know, put to get up kind of my leadership development plan for the team as we're talking through. And there are things that I will still work on. There are things that I'll emphasize. There are expectations um, that teams can expect from me as their leader. And we kind of outline those and talk through. Um, but I think it's, you know, I think so many of us think it's a, you know, we get there and we're done. It's a continual journey. Um, and you're continuing to refine that leadership story and what leadership means to you and for the team that you're engaging with. Um, everyone needs to know what to expect from their leaders and it goes both ways. And so, um, you know, it's it's interesting because it's one of those things that I'll, I'll never stop growing. And I think we recognize that as we come through FFA, that it is that continual evolution. But I think with all of the additional detractions, we kind of think, okay, well, I've got that. You only have it as good as you practice it. And, um, you know, and, and we did, we lost a lot of that in COVID when we were more isolated or we were engaging only via Zoom. And, you know, it's only now after a year that we're really out there that you start to realize what all we lost. Um, and that muscle memory goes away a little bit until you exercise it again. And, and leadership is, is one of those things. I like that. I, I, you know, it's funny. I, when we went through COVID, I told somebody I do not mind. I, I would not use this. Is, this is just me personally. I would not use the term socially distant. So I told people I don't mind being physically distant, but I'm going to refuse to be socially distant. Yeah. We're going to try to use technology or phone or something to maintain some type of relationship, some type of communication. Yeah. And, and relationships uh, are so important. 
I was with a little, I was on a call with some kids from across the United States and a young lady from North Carolina. She asked me, she said, Mr. Alejandro, she says, my dad's a, a preacher. And she said, do you think that when COVID is over with, do you think we will go back to gathering as a congregation? Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah. I said, I think I can answer that question quickly, accurately, and pretty much with some insight. And she said, well, how do you know? And I said, well, my 50 plus years on this earth, I said, I've never seen birds not flock, dogs not pack, fish not <laughs> school, cattle not graze together. I said, everything that I've ever seen in this world is, is by design relational. Mm -hmm. And I said, yes, we're smart enough to know that right now we got to be taking precaution. But trust me, when it's over with, we will go back to doing what we do. And that is to be in relationship. But to your point, I think we're still kind of working on that rhythm of finding it. But I think we will overcome that. And I do believe we'll get back to what we were designed for. And we weren't designed to be the Lone Ranger. Right. We, we were designed to work with others because, I, you know, just like, you know, uh, none of us is as strong as all of us. Absolutely. So we got to work together. OK, Neely, how many states in the United States have you been to? Oh, I, I would say almost all. I don't, I couldn't guess by number right now, but maybe there's four maybe that I haven't. How many um, countries have you been to? Oh, at one point I counted my passport. Um, so it's been a while. I would say 25, 30 plus. Um, okay. So here's this, this, this professional here who came from an FFA program outside of the Houston area. And um, now you've been in all but four states and 27 countries. You've, I'd you say know, you've seen you've seen a few things. I, I have, you know, and it, just to show you, I mean, we we always traveled for livestock shows across the southern states. And, you know, we had done our leadership conferences in D.C., but I didn't have a passport when I joined um, ExxonMobil. And my first um, international assignment was in Colombia and, and South America. And so it was, you know, country come to town. I had to go get my passport. I had to get all of that figured out. And, and then it became normal. So I felt like I had not been sheltered and we had had exposure, but I my walls were still within um, the United States. And so um, I've been very fortunate to have the opportunity to travel to a bunch of these countries, met fantastic folks, seen different cultures, um, you know, it makes you appreciate what you have. It makes you um, appreciate, you know, the vastness uh, and the interconnectedness uh, of all of it too. And and so very fortunate, but yeah, it, you know, there were, it wasn't like it was an automatic and, oh yeah, I'll just do this. It was like, okay, now I got to get my house in order, figure out how to get a visa, how to work through all that, because that was, that was new for me at the time. All right. Well, let's translate that based on what you've seen. And I mean, obviously, those of us that know you, we trust you. Uh, what is it that Zig Ziglar says? He says, if if they know you, they'll listen to you. But if they trust you, they'll do business with you. So we trust you. So in all your experiences and all that you've seen, um, are there opportunities out there? If I'm a kid and I'm listening right now, you know, I hear a lot of gloom and doom. Neely, are there any opportunities when I get out of high school? Are there any opportunities when I get out of college? What do you see both domestically and globally that you could shed light on? Absolutely. You know, I think when we came out of COVID, there were a lot of folks that were were laid off. And then we, we've started to come out of that bubble. And then, of course, there's been a lot of tech um, layoffs that were announced. Um, but there are always opportunity and there will be industries that will thrive more than others at different times. And so again, it's that openness. And I think it's understanding what your fundamental skills and interests are. Um, because on paper, I would have thought agriculture was the only industry. Then I, I realized oil and gas actually crosses over a lot in those same skills that I could use in, in agriculture, I could also use in this industry. Um, and so, again, it was a door that wouldn't have been obvious to me. But when someone highlighted the opportunity, I could easily find the synergies. And I think, again, if you know yourself and you know what your strengths are, you know what your passion is, um, you're willing to be challenged, you're willing um, to try um, new opportunities. 
I think you have a ton of opportunity. Um, but I think if you let limit yourself to a certain field or to a certain geography, I think that's when you start bringing in kind of the guardrails that really narrow your path. And so I would say, um, regardless of where in the world you, you want to operate, you can have international exposure from a U.S. based company. You don't necessarily have to have the international based role, to have an international assignment. Um, we tell many of our, our colleagues that same kind of thing, understanding those skills. If you love variety, if you love interaction with folks, um, if you're better behind a computer, know those things and then look for jobs and that have those base skills allow yourself to enhance those skills, then you can always go back into the industry that may have been your number one choice, but you may actually be surprised that it's the passion of what you're doing and being able to leverage the skills that you're strong at, that at the end of the day, it doesn't necessarily matter what field it in as long as you're able to make a difference. You know who I think of when you said that? I meant she is my go-to exactly for what you just said. You never know where you may find a career. And that is Dr. Temple Grandin. Mm. Because Temple was not in the cattle business. She was not in the agricultural business. But because she was open and she was paying attention, she was exposed to it. And because she was, she found her career. And look at what you've done. You found a career. Um, I mean, you got, like I said, you got to sign up and you got to pay attention. And you did all those things. And uh, that's why we're so proud when we get to watch your career unfold. Because we're like, that, that's that. this is how you're supposed to do it right here. So yeah, I appreciate that. But and, I, you know, I've, I've loved being a part of the foundation board because that also, again, makes sure I maintain that connectedness to FFA. Um, and, you know, we also have a place in the country with horses and um, the cattle on the property. And so, again, it's also that that's where I get grounded. So mm -hmm. sometimes stepping away from the day to day weekends, holidays, that's where you'll find us because, to me, I always say it's my great perspective changer. You know, many of us are fortunate to be to grow up in a rural area. You see it every day. Others of us have to move to a city to find what works for us. And so you miss that. But finding that um, ability to connect back with that natural foundation that you had is is one of the things that I I love. So looking forward to doing that as we go near the holidays, because you come back refreshed, recharged, and you're reminded of what's really important in life. Well, I don't have the horses and the cattle and all that, but I do love my outdoor time. I'm a big, you know, wildlife management person. And I call that my mental health time because absolutely, like you said, just to get out there, the fresh air, the quiet, to watch the sunrise and the sunsets and see God paint those sunrises and sunsets. It's just pretty special. So, well, Neely, thank you so much. We, we covered a lot of ground. You yeah, did. This is good. great. I love talking about the FFA and I love chatting with you. So thank you, Aaron, for well, asking me and, and for the opportunity to engage. Well, once again, folks, this is why I enjoy doing these podcasts because everybody's got a story. Everybody's got a, everybody that's listening to this has a story. Not everybody's willing to share their story. But when you share your story, there's going to be somebody that's going to hear it that needed to hear that at that particular time. And there's somebody right now sitting in a class somewhere and saying, you know, I can really relate to what Miss Nelson said. I can really relate to her journey. And maybe I am on the right path. And maybe I need to be a little more open to, to possibilities. Um, by the way, talking about that, Neely, I talked to the state officers the other day and I told them, uh, I do want y'all to be open-minded. Please be open-minded. Uh, just don't be so open-minded your brain falls out. So, <laughs> <laughs> because I, I'm like you, I, I want to, I, I mean, I'm the ag guy, but yet I take corporate guests to eat sushi and sashimi. You know, I, I want people to be open to, to go to theater and to, you know, go to a road experience thing that, that might not be in your wheelhouse, uh, because I think that's how you learn. Uh, plus, it gives you something to talk about. It gives you a new, another communication tool. Right. That's so. True. Anyway, Neely, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, any last words of wisdom you want to share? No, I would I would just say, you know, your leadership story is yet to be written. You hold the pen. And so I encourage you to, to think about what that means to you and what you want to be long term, the impact that you want to make, the impressions you want to leave, and then figure out how to get there. Um, and it may be a story that has 
a few winding roads, um, but you write the story so you can certainly get to the end point. So I wish, I wish all of our students the best as they write their leadership story. Well, thank you for that. And and we also, uh, Neely will tell you too, that you don't get there, students. Uh, you're, 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 like we said earlier, you're not the Lone Ranger. You got to have coaches and mentors along the way. And those ag sure. teachers do a, a good job of doing that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I am a fan of the ag teachers from Katy, Texas. I remember them in 1985 when I was state FFA president. And then I had the pleasure to work with them, uh, to work with Gerald Young. And uh, I can tell you, whenever they chronicle the history of the Texas FFA, which I hope they do someday, I think what they're going to find is they're going to be a very critical benchmark in the history of Texas FFA. And that benchmark was when Gerald Young was hired at the Ag Teachers Association because the collaboration between Gerald, uh, Tom Maynard, and myself created some of the most significant changes in Texas Team Ag Ed, which are still growing to this day. So, um, Neely, thank you for sharing your your dad with us as well. Uh, is your professional role, so. he's, he's got a passion like you do, and and the passion together you got you all, um, as you said, um, made great changes that um, students are benefiting from today, and um, really impactful. And you know, folks that believe in leadership as a mission, and um, so thank you for that. And, you know, love what I do. So uh, with that, you get one last question. Every interview wraps up with a fun question. So here's the fun question. What's the best concert you've ever been to? Oh my goodness, this is going to be hard. So we go to, you know, the Houston Rodeo. So we see almost all the performance every year. Um, but I'm going to go with one that's kind of out on the skirts of country. Um, okay. For King and Country, which is a Christian group, but have a foundation and, and, and country and some of what they sing um, it was phenomenal. The instruments and the, it was just a show from start to finish. And so um, it was really fascinating, but certainly you can't, um, you don't forget the concerts with George Strait or Garth Brooks. Those are all fantastic as well. Oh yeah. Well, King and Country, uh, the little drummer boy. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> how good is that? Right. So Absolutely. It's the instruments. They'll get you every time. <laughs> That's great. All right. Well, folks, thank you for joining us for today's podcast. We appreciate you stopping by. And, you know, Abraham Lincoln said, he said, the philosophy of the schoolroom in one generation will be the philosophy of government in the next. Now, think about that. What we do today is what our city, state, country is going to look like tomorrow. Well, if we want to know what the future is, we got to grow it. Well, how do you grow it? You got to plant the right seeds. You got to nurture them. You got to harvest them. And then you got to feed other people. And that's what Growing Our Future podcast is all about. It's planting seeds of greatness um, so that in the in the words of that, that old saying, the essence of leadership is to plant trees under whose shade you may never sit. So Neely, hopefully today we planted some trees. So thank you for joining us. And until we catch everybody again down the road, yeah, everybody be safe, be encouraging, and go out and do something great. Thank you.